Okay, my thanks for the opportunity to speak today. Uh, my name is Larissa Hatch and I work in the Genomics Research Centre in the Centre for Personalised Health, Gen Genomics and Personalised Health at uh, EBA QUT in Brisbane, Australia. So um, it's nice to be with you today. So today I'm going to talk to you about uh, our work involving in vitro models of human neurogenesis. So one of the reasons, of course, we look at these is because of neurological disorders. They have a high prevalence of impact on society in terms of mil affecting millions worldwide. They are really um, encompassed by and characterized by a loss of neural cells, including specific subtypes in specific neurodegenerative diseases. And the question that we ask ourselves is how can we exploit stem cell therapies to restore neural function? So adult neurogenesis takes place in two uh, key areas of the human brain, the subventricular zone and the subgranular zone. Now, these two areas give rise to uh, human neural stem cells, and these cells give rise, of course, to the cells that we know that encompass the neural system and the brain. And these include the radial glia, the neural progenitor cells, neurons, astrocytes, and oligodendrocytes. One thing that we're interested in in particular is the neural niche, and we're interested in this because we're interested in the family of proteins called the proteoglycans. So the neural niche is encompassed by a um, extracellular matrix, and this is comprised of a number of different components, including things like collagen, fibronectin, and of course the proteoglycans. It's a highly dynamic and, and constantly remodeling um, aspect of, of the um, tissue structure, but it provides developmental cues and structural support, and of course it um, is uh, key in, in modulating stem cell precursors in, in the subventricular zone and the subgranular zone of the human brain. And of course, it supports neurogenesis throughout life and is responsible for mediating the, the responses and the factors that mediate both uh, injury and repair. So one of the things that I wanted to briefly touch on is the fact that we work on human st neural stem cells and not neuron neural stem cells. And this is because clearly, apart from obvious differences, humans and mice share different uh, different characteristics. Obviously, um, that's related to a lot of things, but it, it's also in particular related to characteristics that not only govern stem cell behavior, but also the differentiation processes. This includes things like their cell surface marker profile, their ability to grow, their ability to differentiate, the growth factors and cytokine signaling that mediate these factors, along, along with telomeres and sensitivity to growth factors. So clearly, um, we want to work with human cells because we think they're more representative of what happens in the human system. As I mentioned, we're mostly interested in the family of proteins called the heparin sulfate proteoglycans, and really there are two main um, families of these. They encompass a large number of proteins, but we're really focusing on two families, the cinecans and the glipicans. The cinecans are, contain four members, and aptly named uh, cinecans one to four, and the glipicans have six members, glipicans one to six. And we can see that the glipicans span the plasma membrane, and um, these uh, heavily sulfated side chains, and I won't go into the biochemistry of how they're produced, but it's through these side chains and this sulfation profile that these HSPGs interact with and modify um, so the responses based on what growth factors they can bind. So HSPGs facilitate a number of growth factor bindings. They serve as receptors and co-receptors. They also have uh, concentration gradients and respond to those that also mediate those. And of course, they interact with a number of organs, including growth factors and such as FGFs and PDGFs, and almost any growth factor you can name interacts with HSPGs on all cell surfaces. So what we focus on, as I said, is the HSPGs, and when we look at those in neural cell populations, most of this work has previously been done in neuron models, and that's been to look at things like how they react and, and modify things like stem cell fate. We know that cinecans in particular are, are involved in neuroepithelial stem cells and, and their ability to what we refer to as maintain plasticity or self-renew. But we also know that several of these um, HSPGs in the glipicans and cinecans have been identified to play key roles in neuronal lineages, astrocyte lineages, and, and oligodendrocyte lineages. So we know that they've had a role in lineage commitment, differentiation, maturation, axon guidance, and synapse genesis. So that's, of course, one of the reasons why we're interested in looking at them in, in human models. Now, in terms of what our group does, we look at a number of different in vitro models of human neurogenesis, and this includes both primary populations as well as immortalized cell lines. We've used the human uh, HNSCH9 cells, human normal, uh, normal human progenitor cells, and human mesenchymal stem cells, and I'll go into that a little bit more in a moment. We also use a number of other immortalized cell models, and these include the SH SY51 neuroblastoma cells as a, as a control, as well as the REN cells, the CX and the VMs, as, as a way of mediating and examining these um, processes of neurogenesis. Now, I'll put this slide up here because I want to show basically the, the variety of cells that we use, but also the similarity and differences in the components and 
uh, culture conditions that we use in these cells. Some of them grow on a substrate, for instance, the HNSCH9 grow on a gel trex, which is effectively a watered down matra gel. Some of them grow as adherents, some of them grow as suspension cultures, etc. But what um, this does show you, of course, is the breadth of models that we use and, um, how, we, and how we use them and why we use them. So I mentioned briefly that we use mesenchymal stem cells, and this is not a common uh, feature of mesenchymal stem cells that they can differentiate into neural lineages. Commonly, they're used to look at um, osteogenesis, chondrogenesis, and adipogenesis because they're obviously key um, mesenchyme cells. But these non-immortalized cells can play two roles in, in um, neural genesis. They can play, um, contribute to the, the neural niche for that supportive structure, but they can also become neural cells themselves. And in our hands, we've um, identified that they provide an, a, a good model to investigate the neural niche and neural stem cell fate decisions. And of course, they also enable us to produce a large number of cells for downstream in vivo applications. So this is some work that we published quite some time ago in Okachani et al. And this, this shows us basically our ability to expand these primary cultures for up to about 100 days or 20 um, population doublings in culture. We characterize these cells, we looked at things like their uh, neural lineage marker profile, their, their self-renewal markers, as well as their Clifford-Can and Syndicant um, expression profile. And what you can see, I hope, from the graph on the bottom right, is that there is some similarity and um, uh, commonality to the trends of these marker profile expressions. We then, of course, also want to differentiate these cells because we can grow these cells and we can establish that they have neural potential. But what, of course, we want to look at is downstream, how can they become functional and actually fix anything that's gone wrong? So to do this, we do what's called uh, an intermediate sphere formation. So we, we form um, spheres from these cells. And this involves culturing the cells for a few days as an adherent culture, forming these spheres on low attachment plates, and then examining the different lineages for up to about 30 days. And we do that in different ways. So this slide here just shows you the different uh, um, uh, spheres that are formed from these cultures. We can see that the, the size of the, um, the sphere formed does vary a little bit depending on how old the cells are in terms of their, their time in culture. When we do some live dead staining, we can see that um, in a classic image of FDAPI staining, red is dead and green is good. And we can see that the number of cells, and in fact the majority of cells in the um, sphere formed are in fact alive. And then, of course, when we stain these cells with something like a TENI4 antibody for a, a pan HSPG, we can see that these spheres contain a lot of proteoglycans. Interestingly, we also looked at things like, as, we, as I mentioned, these cells are commonly looked at to look, to look at um, the osteogenic and adipogenic lineages. And we can see that, that marker profile and that, that aspect of those cells and that potential of those cells goes down when these spheres are formed. We, of course, also looked at things like pluripotency and neural stem cell markers in these cells, as well as neural lineage markers. And what you can see in this slide is a com comparison between the neural stem cells, the HNSCH9s, the mesenchymal stem cells, and the induced neurosphere for the MSCs. And we can see that the MSCs really reflect an expression profile in general that's more reflective of the HNSCH9s. So we see that they express pluripotency markers and, we express, and they express neural lineage markers. As I mentioned, they also express things like the heparin sulfate proteoglycans and their biosynthetic machinery, including the NDSTs, HS. Um, sulfur transferases, and they express the chondroitin sulfates. And we haven't looked at chondroitin sulfates in a lot of detail, and I'm sure some of you will be disappointed we haven't done that, but we are we are planning on it, and if anyone wants to help, we're happy to collaborate. One of the other cell models we also looked at was the HNSC H9 cells. Now, these cells are grown in a monolayer. They have quite a distinctive um, neural morphology, and again, we expanded these for as long as we could in culture. And again, we found that these cells went for about 100 days, or in their case, about 31 population doublings. And again, they maintain their viability, and of course, um, it continues to express levels of high threat, in, in, indicating that these cells are self-renewing continually throughout this expansive culture. We, of course, looked at uh, characterization of these cells, and we looked at things like their self-renewal markers and their lineage markers, whether it was neural, astrocyte, or gadendrocyte. And we can see that these cells maintain this uh, potential profile throughout this um, expansion in culture. So they maintain self-renewal, they maintain multi-lineage markers, there's 100 days of culture. And when we combine a lot of that data together, what we find is the HNSCH9 cells, and we compare them to neuronal lineages, the neural progenitor cells, and the astrocyte lineage cells, we got quite an um, interesting map of what, what markers are expressed at what stage, including not just, of course, the classic lineage markers, but also the synecans, the glipicans, and the HSPG PG biosynthetic machinery. So 
the next stage of, the, of this, of course, was to differentiate your cells for a longer period to try and get some sort of functionality out of these cells. So it's all well and good that these cells have the potential to become the different cells of the brain to be able to repair or, or fix damage, but you know, are they going to be functional? So to do this, we grew the cells for 40 and 60 days in culture, and we grew them under neural, neuronal conditions where we um, added some different growth factors. And then we also had added other common uh, neural growth factors, BDNF and PDGF, and we looked at the, what the cells um, became after 40 and 60 days. And you can see these cell clusters and these big, strong connections of cells between the clusters formed. And this told us that we were seeing some very interesting um, results and potentially these cells were going to be functional. We, of course, again looked at SDA API staining to determine if these cells were alive or dead. And what you can see in the graph below is that, again, the majority of the cells are alive in these cultures. So that was that was good news. And we sort of found something interesting that there was increased survival of the PDGF and BNF treated cells um, when we compare them to untreated cultures. And we're, we're looking into that into more detail. We obviously, of course, looked at things like um, lineage markers and including uh, Nestin and, and S100B at both day 40 and day 60. And we show that we show that during differentiation, these neural cultures do maintain some level of heterogeneity. And you'll see those small levels of S100B stain throughout these neuronal cultures. Now, this to me is not a bad thing. I think some level of heterogeneity is a good thing in terms of these long cultures because I think that bodes well and bodes better for some type of therapies. I could be alone in that. So when we compare all of that data to the data of our HMSCs, what we can see is our induced neurospheres really represent an intermediary phenotype between um, the HNSPCs and um, common progenitor cells. So we, and, and the uh, differentiated cells. So if we look at the a marker profile again, we can see that this similarity, these multiple neural stem cells, the common progenitor cell, really share the features of HMSCs, these induced neurospheres. So this is quite interesting to us, and of course what we also noticed was this uh, trend and similarity in the biosynthetic machinery of HSPGs as well as the core protein expression profile. So we can grow these cells under basal conditions, and we can also grow these cells under differentiation position uh, conditions, which of course means altered growth factors. So to do this, we grow them in various um, culture vessels with various attachments. And I just put this up to show you the different things that we can add or take away from cultures. And I think what's probably most interesting from one, from this slide that I'd like you to take away is that these in vitro modulations that we perform, including the addition of heparin, is a common step for maintaining self renewal in a lot of stem cell models. So. We use it as a measure of um, our HSPG activity, but it's interesting that these cells really require heparin for maintaining their plasticity. So when we look at uh, the HSN and H9s versus the RENCX cells, for instance, and the basal cells, we can see that there's, I'm not gonna go into too much detail on this slide, but what is there is a, a similarity and a difference in their expression profile of things like cell from neural markers, neuronal markers, astrocyte markers, and oligodendrocyte markers. We do the same thing with our um, HS. PG biosynthetic machinery. And again, we can see a lot of similarity, but some differences in terms of the expression profile of these markers across these cell models. When we focus on specifically the simicans and the glipicans, again, similarities, but these strong similarities are starting to emerge a pattern of what we're seeing with these cells in terms of the key simicans and key glipicans during these cultures. So as I said, we established some conditions to look at modula modulation of these cultures, and one was by the addition of heparin a common agonist and uh, an antagonist of these cultures, which basically is a proliferative agent in many cell cultures, as well as BNF and PDGF. And of course, we did some dose response curves to ensure these cells were responsive. And then we looked at um, trying to add these growth factors to these cultures to really try and reduce the time in culture needed for these cells to become functional. So the earlier cultures that were day 40 and day 60, we'd really like to be able to cut that down, particularly for a therapeutic endpoint. So as a way to do this, we compared the cells to the SH, um, SY5Ys as a control. We looked at the REN cells under astrocyte and REN VMs under spontaneous differentiation. And we had endpoints of 14 and 18 days, which is obviously much shorter than the 60 day cultures we've done. When we look at these, we can see some clear morphological changes. The astrocyte cultures become a little bit um, more disparate and, and separated out and, and really become quite district, district colonies of cells, and you can see the RENVMs under these mixed conditions really become quite small cell bodies with um, extensions that uh, make them look a little bit more neural. Again, FDA API showed there's a high viability in these cultures, and we can see these, you know, these star-shaped REN cells and these small cell body processes in the VMs provide a clear phenotypic difference in what's happening with these cultures. We then, of course, looked at the HSBG profile of these cells, and again, we found some differences 
in particular a mixture of neural progenitor and neuron astrocyte and oligodendrocyte markers, which was reflective of really the phenotype we were seeing. So a measure of how we look at this uh, functionality was to use a fluoro 4 calcium indicator for the calcium um, synchronization oscillation. So if you have a look on the left-hand panel of this slide, this is the MTF human breast cancer cell line. And what I'm hoping you can see is that there is a general uptake of the fluorescent dye. So you can gradually see the cells become more intense in color. What's interesting is you compare this to the cells on the right-hand side, which is a positive control, which is the HNSBH9 neural cells. We can see that not only can we see this uptake, but we can also see some firing of the signal across the cultures. And this is interesting to us because of course, this means that at day 60 we're getting um, activity and really what we would say is some sort of um, functionality in the cells. So of course we looked at the SY5 ways in these much shorter cultures, the RENs and the CXs and the VMs to compare them to see if we can see these similar differences in these calcium oscillations. So in the SY5 ways we can see some really clear um, calcium synchronicity and, and waves of um, uptake throughout the cultures. In the REN astrocytes we can see really similar to the MCF7, we can see this sort of uptake, but also that firing around those small colonies of cells. And in the um, in the, in the mixed um, RENVMs, again, it's, this is most similar to the um, breast cancer cells, we can see that gradual uptake of dye. So the astrocytes, the RENCXs seem to be talking to each other, the RENVMs seem to be um, absorbing and showing some calcium oscillation and fluctuation, but not really communication. So then we looked at uh, the influence of HS binding growth factors, including BDNF and PEGF. BDNF is supposed to and, and has historically been uh, identified to be uh, reflective of um, maintaining plasticity, whereas PDGF is really an embry embryonic mature marker. And if we look at this, we can see changes in cell numbers, a high level of viability. And again, when we look at this um, change in calcium oscillation, in untreated cells, we see a gradual uptake of the dye on the left-hand panel. In the BDNF treated cultures, we see also a gradual uptake, but these quite distinct and discrete um, clusters of cells. In the PDGF cells, we see much larger clusters of cells, but localized calcium um, fluctuation activity. So we can see that general uptake, but in discrete areas where those arrows are, you can see where that signal is passing between the cells. So this is quite interesting to us. Of course, there's more work to do. And, and this work, this slide really summarizes the majority of this work where we see these changes in there. Uh, expression profile of these neural HSPG um, as well as biosynthetic enzymes, neural enzymes and, and other enzymes. And we can see that there's a change in the expression profile and a similarity of these cultures with our primary HNC H9 cultures that were also growing for 15 to 18 days. So this tells us that the RAN cells are providing a good model of what trying to mimic in, in our neurogenesis in vitro and it gives us a great platform to continue to work on. We've obviously got more work to do and there are some good people doing this work, and this includes Rachel and Ian, who are still with us, Lauder and, and Jade produced a lot of data in this presentation, and they've moved on to um, bigger pastures. Have a lot of other people to thank, including some funding bodies as well as some collaborators throughout the world. Um, as I said, if you're looking for um, uh, some collaborative opportunities, we'd be happy to discuss this with you. There's much to do, and we certainly can't do it all. So thanks for your attention. Cheers.